As many of you know, I'm a real enthusiast when it comes to choosing organic, whether it's food, beauty, personal care products, even homewares and clothing. Organic cotton, organic cotton, organic cotton, organic, oh, it looks like it's falling off. Organic cotton, organic cotton. I probably should have ironed that one. Sorry. You get the idea. And I know to lots of people this might seem a little over the top, but let's just say the more I've learned in recent years, the more I know it's absolutely the right choice. About a year ago, the Soil Association asked me to become one of their ambassadors. They asked if I'd be up for making a video, sharing why I choose organic fashion and homewares and what I've learned along the way. My own little journey of how I discovered organic textiles and why I now know it's the best choice I can make. It all began with this play suit, which I still wear to this day. I could even be wearing it right now as I'm doing this voiceover. You'll never know. It was the first piece of organic clothing I had ever come across. I stumbled upon it during one of my many Saturday afternoon shopping trips to H&M. It was part of their first ever conscious collection, which launched back in 2011. And let's just say it got me thinking, clothing could be organic too? Fast forward to 2017, and let's just say I'm a bit of an organic material enthusiast. Yep, that's a hammock made from, you guessed it, organic cotton. Like most people, when I thought of natural materials, cotton had always seemed like the purest, most natural fiber out there. But between the genetically engineered seeds, the pesticides and herbicides, chlorine bleach and toxic finishes, even this so-called natural fiber ain't so natural anymore. Cotton currently supplies around 33% of the apparel industry, and it's the most widely used natural fiber in clothing today. Farmers are planting more genetically modified seed in the hope of increasing yields and incomes. But the reality is they're tied into buying expensive seeds and chemical pesticides each year from multinational companies. One of the people I really look up to in the sustainable fashion world is Safia Mini, founder of sustainable clothing brand People Tree and now managing director at the ethical shoe brand Pozu. She's seen firsthand how farming cotton organically has improved the lives of the farmers. So 25 years ago, you know, I was passionate about finding organic fair trade cotton. The journey through India um, came about with some amazing fair trade social projects that bit by bit helped us to piece together um, one of the first, well probably the first organic and fair trade cotton supply chain. I think the impact of organic cotton is, is utterly huge. It's, it's life transformational because when farmers choose to go organic, it stops their enslavement to chemical and seed companies. I was super excited to get the chance to chat with Peter Melchett, policy director at the Soil Association. The GM crops are really uniquely unsuited to farming in developing countries because if you're a farmer in a developing country and you go through a really bad time, really hard times, what you get left with in a period of starvation is your land and any fertility that's in the land. You should have saved some seed, or at least the women in your community will have saved some seed. They were traditionally responsible for looking after that and stopping the men blowing it all, taking a short-term view. And the danger is you go into debt at that point and you'll take a loan and you buy these expensive Western seeds and manufactured fertilizer often imported, the chemical sprays that go with it. Then if anything goes wrong with the crop, disaster. If you farm organically, in those circumstances, you've got your fertilizer in your soil and you've got your chemical control in your farming system. You don't have to buy it in. And hopefully you've got the seed. But of course, you couldn't save the seed if you were growing GM. So that's why intensive agriculture and GM crops particularly have been such a disaster in developing countries, apart from the fact that they've stopped working. GM cotton in India has recently gone badly wrong. The pink bollworm <laughs> took its revenge <laughs> on Monsanto, which they thought they'd wiped it out. And the pink bollworm has started to decimate GM cotton crops, aided by some white fly, which have become resistant as well. Organic farming always makes a real difference to farmers, to people working on farms and to communities around farms, because you first of all, get rid of all the chemical sprays, all the pesticides. Globally, of all the crops in the world, 
16% of insecticides, of things to kill insects, are used on cotton. And of course it's nowhere near 16% of all the crops grown in the world, all over the world. And these are chemicals now being used in poorer countries. Farmers don't have the full protective gear. I farm in Norfolk here, and my neighbours, when they go spraying, will very often have a suit that makes them look like somebody from outer space. You know, with a helmet and a glass visor and a whole body suit and gloves. The cotton farmer in India or in West Africa is walking through the field, maybe in sandals, maybe in bare feet, in shorts, a knapsack on their back. We try to tell the positive stories and we try to sort of share and explain the sort of, look how much better things could be if we grew more and more organically, specifically cotton, but other fibers too, whether it's wool or linen or hemp or anything. But of course, the downside is 3 million people a year are poisoned by pesticides and 20,000 people a year die from pesticide poisoning. So one of the stories that came uh, from India, from activists, um, campaigners in India over many years, has been the story of Indian farmers committing suicide because of debt. This has been dismissed by um, people in favor of industrial agriculture, and particularly GM interests, as being a non-story. A team of, of global scientists, including very well-respected British scientists, have analysed the data. There is a clear, statistically valid link between farmers growing GM crops and the level of suicide. One of the most important things about organic is actually the impact that cotton farming has on the farmers. So it's not actually necessarily about us. Organic farms control pests and disease and control weeds through variety. And the variety involves producing food. So organic farmers have that amazing um, requirement. It's not even an ability. It's a requirement to farm in that way, in that diverse way. But also, of course, it means that they're more resilient because farming one crop, if you're a conventional GM cotton farmer or cotton farmer, you've just got cotton, you've been growing it year after year. If anything goes wrong with it, what do you do? You're in real trouble. If you're an organic farmer, you've got some of your fields growing organic cotton, but some are growing a food crop, some are growing a legume, food for your family, very often a surplus for the village, for the local community. You know that even though cotton is a cash crop, it's grown in rotation with, with other crops that are consumed locally um, by the families and sold in the local market. So it has a profound impact. Organic farming depends on having healthy soil. You can have big stores of carbon in organically farmed soil, enough to offset maybe a third of agricultural emissions globally over all crops. But that's not the end of the story. Puma did the study and they found 40% less greenhouse gas emissions from organic cotton. One of the excitements was really going into the organic cotton field um, and walking and finding just how spongy the soil was. I, mean, I love earthworms and you, know, you don't have to dig far to just find you know, hundreds of them. Um, whereas when you walk onto a conventional cotton field, it's like tarmac. If the rain comes um, very, very quickly, it's, it's unable to hold the rain, which, which has enormous implications for um, drought-ridden areas of, of India, for example, and, and West Africa. Cotton production is highly dependent on water. Most conventional cotton is artificially irrigated, depleting local water sources such as lakes and rivers, threatening ecosystems, wildlife and water availability. Organic crops basically depend on rainwater and you can cut the amount of water used to grow cotton by about 90% by going organic. And incredibly important in countries where water is a vital and precious and declining resource. In a nutshell, I think as soon as you start looking at the organic cotton and the conventional cotton life cycles, and you, you sort of take in everything about them, it very quickly becomes apparent the multitude of benefits that organic cotton can offer. Certification is actually a great way for consumers to avoid greenwashing. Many companies these days use terms like natural, sustainable, ethical, pure, 
we work in an ethical way. Well, what does an ethical way mean? You know, I look for fair trade, I look for got certified. I think it's really, really important. There are several organic cotton or sustainable cotton certifications out there, but my personal favourite is GOTS, the Global Organic Textile Standard. It's considered to be the gold standard of organic textile certification. It goes beyond simply looking at how the seeds are sown, grown and harvested, and looks at every stage of the process, from production and processing to manufacturing and labelling. It considers environmental impacts such as reducing water and energy usage, as well as setting high social criteria such as safe working conditions, fair pay and no child labour. My name is William Lana. I am a co-founder of Green Fibres and um, we started the company in 1996. So Green Fibres sells a range of organic uh, textile items. So we sell bedding, uh, clothes and sort of products which complement those. But essentially we are a textile company. In 1999, I was approached and asked to help set up the Standards Committee at the Soil Association. There are already existing Standards Committees in various sectors around the sort of food um, industries, but really there was nothing in health and beauty, there was nothing in textiles, and what we wanted to do was to complement what was happening in the food sector in these other areas. We thought, actually, we can make a global standard here for textiles, which means that as the market grows into the 2010s and 2020s, that there will be something there which, uh, which really supports more ethical production. What we did with a number of other certifiers from Germany and other European countries was get together and come up with a global standard. So GOTS is the global organic textile standard, and it applies not just to how the cotton is grown, but how it's processed. We know from horrible stories of terrible accidents in garment factories that processing cotton and how clothes are made can be a source of terrible pollution, terrible working conditions, and the chemicals used in processing, the dyes, that those things are banned from organic as well. If I think about the high thread count, the highest thread count bedding that we do, it's a sateen fabric, we use no chemical finishes on that fabric. And conventionally, up to 8,000 chemicals can be used on textiles as finishing agents. For me, what's so important about organic certification is it allows that sort of level of traceability. I'm Sarah Diddy. I'm the head of policy at Fashion Revolution. Fashion Revolution is a global consumer-focused movement that is demanding a cleaner, safer, fairer, and more transparent fashion industry. There's a couple of different organic or sustainable certifications. The gold standard is the global organic textile standard. That one's probably the most comprehensive in terms of really being stringent about the environmental and social conditions under which the fiber has been made from the very seed right through to the final product. It's looking at things like child labor, discrimination, fair wages, as well as all of those environmental um, aspects. And to get an organic certification, you have somebody come around and look. And very often small farmers will get together, you might have 30 or 50 or 100 in a group, and they'll all be inspected by an inspector, so it's not prohibitively expensive. And it's desperately important, that independent verification. Sometimes, often likely, that fair trade cotton is also organic cotton, and the two standard making bodies often work together. Fair trade's a long way down the road in the right direction anyhow, and you're quite likely to find fair trade and organic going together, and they go well together. The Better Cotton Initiative, which is a, a, a first step, which takes farmers a long way and is very helpful, but then to go beyond that to fair trade and organic. For me, I think, um, for example, BCI, the Better Cotton Initiative, um, is an interesting way of mainstreaming better support for farmers who are often the poorest people in the world. It doesn't go far enough. BCI allows, for example, a genetically modified seed, which is a huge issue. If I'm looking for places to improve, I'd say the, the pace of change is too slow.
In 2014 to 2015, organic cotton production represented only 0.4% of global cotton production, which means there's a huge potential for farmers to convert, especially with the growing interest from large fashion brands wanting to use more sustainable cotton. We are seeing a growth in the market. Recently, there was an international uh, sustainability unit communique. So Prince Charles has a, has a sort of team of people who he leads to work on different industries at different times. And a few years ago, the Soilist Association and the, the other co-lead of this was Marks and Spencer's got together to try to put together a document which could be signed by a number of companies who are aiming to do better, who are aiming to improve their cotton supply chains. In May earlier this year, 13 major fashion brands signed a sustainable cotton communique. What it aims to do is to give a target or a benchmark for companies who want to do better to reach. By 2025, all of the signatories will have 100% of their supply under the umbrella called sustainable cotton. Livelihood-wise, 350 million people around the world depend on cotton production or some aspect of cotton production. If you improve that just by a little bit, you make a huge positive change. And I think more and more boards are realizing that and more and more high street companies are interested in doing that. This was uh, pointed out by Mike Barry, who's in charge of sustainability. Marks and Spencers, thinking about how big companies can make the biggest impact on the most people. Cotton is 90% grown in developing countries. We reckon about 100 million households involved in producing cotton around the world, and they will be amongst the poorest farmers in the world. That's going to make more difference to more poor people just through transforming one supply chain than anything else that we can do. It's really important that brands which affect the global market, the big brands, uh, have clear targets to move to more organic cotton. We've seen people like CNA and H&M do this, and that will drive this incredibly beneficial system of farming. You might be surprised to know that CNA and H&M are actually the top two users of organic cotton by volume. And sport brand Nike is a big purchaser of organic cotton too. So H&M, uh, depending on the year, is the first or second biggest buyer of organic cotton in the world. And I think it's a really great thing because um, there's actually not a lot of organic cotton available. So when a big player comes in and says they want to buy organic cotton, that can entice more farmers to switch their fields to organic. There's been a recent report by Textile Exchange which has shown that more agricultural land is being used to farm organic cotton. I think what we have to make sure of is that we're not fighting over here in the dark green end about this, that, or the next thing. We have to move everybody along with us and reduce the costs and increase the availability so that more and more people can take part in this green velvet revolution. If I'm looking for places to improve, I'd say the, the pace of change is too slow. Even though we are seeing now um, you know, some of the very, very large brands incorporate organic into their uh, conventional fabrics and supply chains. Um, I'd like to see more organic certified uh, and, and perhaps, you know, that being the gold standard as opposed to BCI. I'd like to see more big and small brands and retailers swap to more sustainable alternatives such as organic certified textiles. Mara Hoffman is a great example of how a business can change their supply chain. These are a couple of jumpsuits by Mara Hoffman and they're both made using organic cotton and organic linen, but she hasn't always been super sustainable. My name is Cora Hilt and I am the co-founder of Revon Fair, which is an online retailer of sustainable luxury fashion. So we brought on Mara Hoffman this season, which just was so great because we, met Mara, this is about three years ago, and at the time she was just starting to come around to this idea of sustainability, and I've got to say, she's done it in record-breaking time and with such enthusiasm and, and full commitment to turning her entire line around and really should, I think, be made an example of how people can do this because she's done it without losing her identity. All of her pieces still look as great as they ever did, but now they're made in women's cooperatives in India and using organic cotton and organic linens. Her pieces don't look any different, but everything behind the line has changed. So one of the best ways to encourage brands to switch their cotton to organic is to ask them. More and more 
individual consumers are asking for certification or history uh, evidence or some type of transparency in the in the clothes that they buy and, and that they wear. People nowadays are looking for holistically sustainable companies, so not just one thing. They want to know everything: the labor, the dyeing the finishing, um, sewing, and how everything was grown and processed. They want to know that they're not supporting anything bad with their purchase. People are more interested, they're more aware, they're more empowered. There are two really important things you can do to encourage brands and retailers to use more organic textiles. One is to ask them, contact the brands and retailers you shop from, and tell them that you want them to offer more organic certified options. At Fashion Revolution, we had an industry insider from the apparel sector once tell us that for every customer who contacted them with a question about the way that their clothes have been made, they assume that this represented 10,000 of their customers who thought the same thing but just couldn't be bothered to ask them. So there's a lot of power in consumers' questions and demands. The second big thing is to put your money where your mouth is. Consumers have the most powerful tool at their disposal in that they buy things. Right in the beginning, at the back of our label, we had a little phrase that said, what you buy will be produced, what you don't, won't. They really need consumers to, to be asking for the products and to be sort of buying the products in order for their boardrooms to get behind uh, the ranges. Clearly, there's a growing interest. The Soil Association's organic market report shows growth in both men and ladies' fashion, home textiles, and baby wear. So, for most people, what's the turning point? I think the wonderful thing about not only organic textiles but the organic movement in general is that people come to it in a number of different ways. Sometimes they come to it for health reasons. Perhaps um, they've become parents. I definitely think having kids makes it makes you think about so many things. I met up with my friend Karen, a blogger and mother, and she's had years of experience working in the fashion industry. I was already thinking about the impact of our clothing on people, yeah. but also the impact of our clothing on our environment. And up to that point, I hadn't really thought about, you know, what who am I passing this world on to? <laughs> I think when it first started hitting home was when I was working at an un unnamed high street retailer. Yeah, right, anyway. <laughs> yeah. And I just got really sick of constantly trying to find ways of making clothes cheaper and cheaper. We went to Bangladesh um, and China, but Bangladesh was really hard. Just seeing the poverty, seeing the way that people live. You know, we were taken to some of the best beautiful factories, obviously. We're not going to be taken somewhere awful. But I still found the environment quite oppressive. The workers, in my opinion, were clearly scared of the factory owners. There were big doors which looked like it could, know, be it could be locked. Okay. There was all sorts of things that just kind of raised in mine and my designer's head. We just came away kind of having these big chats about actually, are we okay with this? It made us feel quite uncomfortable. Yeah. When I left my job um, and had my daughter Daisy, I started writing about fashion because that's what I knew and started blogging. Yeah. And it was through that that I suddenly really started getting into thinking about actually what am I buying? Where is it from? How is it made? At the children's wear market, there's some absolutely beautiful and organic. Really? Brands. Oh, yeah, so really, really lovely. I'll have to show you only the clean ones. <laughs> the Bright Company. This is um, one of their spring summer. Ooh, um, that's nice. Prince, which is so really clean. Lovely. Very clean, yeah. And also, I like the fact that it is completely unisex. <laughs> I love that. That's hilarious. <laughs> I have been given so many pre-loved clothes, which is fantastic, yeah. which is amazing. But it's it's really interesting to look at what has lasted and what hasn't. Yeah. A lot of the organic oh. cotton seems to have not stretched, seems to like the shape of the garment still intact. Papu. Oh, no, I don't, I don't know many Papu kids are brands. finished. <gasps> and they've just got really lovely details you like. You yeah. can turn them up when the kid's younger, and then you can turn it down as they grow, so they'll last longer. I think also the Rana Plaza factory collapse was a real watershed moment. It was a real eye-opener for consumers. I would say that sadly, the, the turning point was the horrific Rana Plaza tragedy. One of the outcomes was that uh, people actually do care 
um, about where their clothes are made, um, who make their clothes, how they are made, what materials companies are using. I am Dominika. I work for People Tree. I've been with a friend for almost three years and I look after the press department and creative coordination. We've definitely seen a growing interest um, from consumers as well as from businesses um, in ethical fashion. So I'm wearing People Tree. Yay, yeah. love People Tree. When you get a People Tree garment, it says on the label where it's been made and who's made it. I don't have any facts or figures, but I definitely have seen a change in people's perceptions around what sustainable clothing looks like over the last five years. It's not brown or beige, it's not shapeless, it's not scratchy, it's beautiful. One of my personal favorite online retailers for sustainable fashion is Rêve en Vert. They've done a great job of showing just how beautiful organic clothing really is. Of course we have Emma Watson. She's got this Instagram called The Press Tour where she documents all of her outfits that she wears. I think that's done a really great job of showing exactly just how beautiful sustainably made clothing can look. When I first started getting into sustainable fashion, my go-to resource was the blog EcoCult. In fact, I still read it pretty much every day. My name's Alda Wicker. I'm the founder of EcoCult.com, a blog that covers sustainable fashion and sustainable living. I'm also a freelance journalist covering sustainable fashion, among other things. Alden Wicker has done an incredible job of introducing a wider audience to exciting sustainable fashion brands. And I've discovered so many cool brands using organic materials through Alden's well-researched and relatable articles, showing just how much choice there is out there. I think we're seeing as organic becomes more and more mainstream, it's becoming more and more accessible, just as you, know, you can go into most supermarkets today and find an organic equivalent. Um, that's what we need to build with organic textiles and, and clothing um, you know, and, and footwear. Um, so I think that there's, there's more and more opportunity for us to seek it out. You can now find people free um, almost everywhere. You can find us in big department stores um, like Jen Lewis, House of Fraser. You can find us online on ASOS. You can find us in, in many beautiful uh, little boutiques across London, across the UK, across Europe and, and the world really. Figures from Textile Exchange show that companies grew sales of organic cotton by 56% in 2016. And I've definitely noticed more availability of organic cotton cropping up on the high street. Recently, I've spotted Selfridges, Muji and John Lewis promoting the fact that they're selling organic clothing, bedding and homewares. I think that sustainability is starting to become a very popular phrase in all levels of fashion. People are starting to talk about it and request it and now that they know a little bit more, like I won't credit you know, high street fashion with very much at all, but I will say that they're starting to spread the word of consciousness. One of the first things I swapped to organic cotton, especially once I started to learn more and more about the many, many, many benefits of organic cotton, was actually our bedding. I kind of figured that we spend a good third of our day, every day, in bed. So it started out with the duvets, sheets, pillowcases, and at the moment I have an organic wool mattress protector, as well as a topper that contains organic wool inside, as well as recycled denim. And I can honestly say that I've had a much better quality of sleep. Case in point, I recently swapped my duvet down at my mother-in-law's place in Cornwall. I'd been sleeping with a synthetic I think it's polyester filled duvet um, and it was so hot and uncomfortable and I was getting really shoddy night's sleep. Uh, so recently I invested in an organic wool one and uh, to use a very intended pun, it was just dreamy. Even my husband, who like wasn't really that fast, or he thought he wasn't that fast, commented on how well he slept once we swapped the duvet out to a natural organic wool duvet. For me, when it comes to choosing animal products like wool, I like knowing that the animal welfare standards are extremely high and certified organic wool will be the highest animal welfare standards out there. And the more I've learned about how things like mattresses can off-gas harmful chemicals and substances into our homes and that we're sleeping on those kind of chemicals, that's something I would like to change in the very near future. So. I think our next mattress purchase will be an organic natural mat one. I'm quite excited about it. It's okay to be excited about buying a mattress, right? And it couldn't hurt to try a few mattresses out, could it? So I may have stopped by the natural mat showroom. Most mattresses are made out of really horrible stuff. The whole bedding industry changed with the advent of synthetic materials 
and polyesters, namely, and polyurethanes. Synthetics do two things. They absorb heat and they absorb moisture, which are the two things you're trying to avoid in any sleeping environment whatsoever. My name is Mark Tremlett. I am the founder of Natural Mat. We make a range of natural fibre and organic beds and mattresses, and we're based in an old boatyard on the River X, uh, just outside Topsham in Devon. Natural fibres are inherently breathable. They're self-ventilating. They don't absorb any moisture, and they allow any kind of moisture that does get into the mattress to be wicked away. And we were the first company to pass all British standards without using any chemicals, without using any glues, without using any bonding agents, and with no synthetics whatsoever. So we're the first company to make and get through British standards a mattress that's made entirely of natural fibres. And we've developed also a range of uh, organic wool pillows and organic wool duvets. When we started, organic wasn't really too much of a buzzword. Over the years, it's become a much better way of ensuring that what you actually have is what it says it is. You know about the husbandry of the farm, you know how the animals are treated properly. One of our favourite, um, I suppose, organic stories and the materials that we use is our uh, lamb's wool. We buy all our wool from farms within a 50 mile radius of where our factory is. So they travel less miles and we get a fantastic product. We buy our coir from the only certified organic coconut plantation, which is in Sri Lanka. And I think what people want to know now is A, where it comes from, how it's made, but also that it's related to where it comes from as well. Organic wool is a natural, renewable, biodegradable and durable fibre. And I love it, especially if it comes from a certified organic source. Organic wool guarantees that any cruel practices are prohibited and that animals are grazed on organic land and can express their natural behaviours. Wool's amazing. It's one of the most perfect natural insulators. So if it's freezing cold outside, it keeps you nice and warm. And if it's boiling hot, it regulates your temperature and allows you to keep nice and cool. So it's a perfect thing to put in a mattress because... At the end of the day, you're trying to maintain a nice, even temperature when you're sleeping. And the other great thing about wool is a natural fire retardant. We put wool in the covers of our mattresses, and we put wool always in the top layer, and, it's, and it works as a natural fire retardant. So it's great. One organic wool product I didn't expect to find on my travels was a kilt made from the only certified organic tartan. I went to Scotland to visit the new Lanark Mill. My name's Alan Barraclough, and I work for New Lanark as textile projects manager. I believe in organic passionately that we should be cleaning up the planet. The original organic wool that we made the kilts out of and the cushions came from Prince Charles at Home Farm down in Gloucester from his organic flock of sheep. It was then sent to Bradford to be organic, organically scoured and to paint box to be dyed all these lovely colours. We've been making the, the kilts now for about two years. There's a lot of new innovative materials that are still really small but I think have a lot of big potential if some of the bigger brands get behind them and start using them more. A new fibre that's made from milk for example. Tencel is, um, is a fabric we introduced to People 3 collections for spring summer 17 and we've been working with it ever since. It comes from a wood pond. It's, it's a really lovely fabric, not uh, just because of the feel, because of the drape. Tencel is extremely sustainable um, because of the closed loop manufacture system which is used. As well as using new sustainable fibres, more designers are getting creative by reusing fabrics that would otherwise go to waste. This t-shirt is made by New York designer Zero Waste Daniel. He rescues cutting floor scraps and reworks them into incredible pieces of clothing. This t-shirt is made from scraps of organic cotton. And I'm really excited to see Rêve en Vert taking a similar approach for their new own label collection. This collection will be mostly made from offcuts. We have found amazing supplies at actually right at the factory we're producing it. They have so much spare fabric that has just gone completely to waste. And I went down there one day and I was like, this is a treasure trove. Like, what's going to happen to this? And they basically were like, well, we're going to have to throw it away. We have upcycled all of these and they're being produced right within the factory. So again, I'm super excited. The carbon footprint is so teeny. As a retailer and now starting to go into the world of design, we have a huge responsibility to then teach our consumers how to take care of their clothes. People would be really surprised by the fact that most environmental impact of your clothing comes during the consumer use and disposal phase, which means we need 
to take better care of our clothes. Really what happens is every time we wash a piece of clothing, the fibers start to disintegrate. These fibers break down and if you're using things like polyester, these fibers go into our waterways and they're incredibly toxic to the oceans, essentially where they end up and those particles will go into the fish we eat and they'll go into our drinking water. Don't overwash your clothes. We wash our clothes too much. If you've got jeans, you really only need to wash them once a month. Second, always wash at 30 degrees. That's Celsius, of course. Switch to a more eco-friendly laundry detergent. Definitely don't use those little plastic pre-packaged detergent balls. This is the worst single-use plastic, I mean, that stuff just goes straight into the waterways. Fabric softener also, obviously it makes your clothes smell nice, but it does break down the fibers of your garments a lot faster. Try to avoid the tumble dryer. The tumble dryer is such a bad carbon emitter. As you guys know, I live a zero waste lifestyle. I'm always thinking about the end life of a product. Where will it end up? Can I repair it? How long will it last? Over the past 10 years, clothing has been the fastest growing waste stream in the UK, with Britain sending around 235 million items of clothing to landfill this year. I'm a big fan of shopping secondhand, and it's a great way of saving resources and diverting items from landfill. Recently, I found this top in a secondhand shop, and yes, it's made from organic cotton too. If you actually look after your clothes properly, you can actually resell it and reclaim some of the money back that you originally paid for it. Bring it to a consignment shop. You can sell it on eBay. You could sell it on apps like Depop or Vestiaire Collective. There's all sorts of options. In terms of disposing of your clothing, never ever put your clothes in the bin. Almost anything can be recycled. Even if it's a pair of pants or that one random sock that you lost the other one, you can recycle that. Find your local textile recycling bin. They're usually all over your city and they will sort through those clothes, figure out what can be reused, what can be recycled, what can be downcycled. So sometimes what happens is they might shred clothes and use that in things like insulation or car stuffing. There's also a number of brands that are now offering a, a take back scheme. If you bring your clothes back to them, they'll help you recycle it. I think we'll see more and more brands begin begin to do this. CNA recently released a line of cradle to cradle t-shirts, which means that um, not only were they made in an environmentally sustainable way, they can be recycled or composted at the end of their life without putting toxins into the soil if you compost them. By making sure that all the ingredients are either biodegradable or recyclable, it, it means that we are then in a position to take back a mattress at the end of its life with that consumer. We can then unpick the mattress and we can take out all of the component parts and then we can recycle all of those component parts. So the materials that go into a mattress never die, they keep going. I'm hearing about advancements in technology that are gonna allow us to hopefully start scanning things and letting us know on the tags where they're from. So we're really on the forefront of looking at all of that as well. You could scan a Revlon Ver garment and it would say, you know, who our designer was, what materials was used in that, and also ideally how you would then recycle it as a customer if you wanted to, which I think is a big thing that's missing in the kind of aftercare of clothing. Looking forward, there are some things that I'm really excited about. One is blockchain technology. Yes, blockchain. Right now it's being used for things like Bitcoin, for money, but basically what blockchain does is creates a verifiable, not paper trail, but digital trail of provenance. Once it's initiated at the beginning of the process, nobody could lie about where that cotton came from. It's either organic or not organic. The consumer would be able to verify really quickly, like where did this cotton come from? Did it come from Uzbekistan? Um, where there's child labor? Did it come from America? So that's really exciting. Another sim similar technology is um, RFID threads. So these are like tiny little threads that go right into the cotton that also allows you to track the provenance and the supply chain of that cotton. These RFID threads can be used in any uh, fabric, which makes recycling the fabric at the end of its life more efficient. Somebody can just scan that RFID thread and they'll know how much of it is cotton, how much of it is polyester, and then they can efficiently sort it instead of sort of looking at a shirt and being like, well, it looks like cotton, I can't find a tag. Those are two really exciting uh, technologies and I'm looking forward to seeing how they develop. Am I a material girl? When it comes to organic textiles, and with all that I've learned, 
How could I not be? Of course, recycling. More like me carrying on using the old, <laughs> the old cotton shirt for, for decades. <laughs> Probably the most sustainable option. Yeah, that's what I argue. There are not that many jobs that you can do lying down. <laughs> do I look like a dork? I go to bed with you guys every night. <laughs> God, Kane, you can't say that on camera. I'm a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> Won't me. Won't me. Up. Great. Don't give yourself enough applause, I think, in my... <laughs> It's actually for sinking purposes. But <laughs> I love that. We're launching a new range of custard. That was a bit serious, wasn't it? Am I slouching? I'm slouching. My mum's going to tell me off. How's that? Too much? <laughs>